Well, I'm in the process right now of getting ready to do an atlatl hog hunt down in Texas. I am putting pitch on all my four shafts. As I was preparing all of these four shafts, I thought about what what stone blade, what stone tool am I going to use to butcher out these hogs? You always have to be putting meat in the freezer. And as I was thinking about it, I was scrolling through that uh, that log of knives that I've built because I like to build them. And I like to use them. I was like, ah, do I do I bring something more of like a hand blade? Do I just bring like a simple hafted knife? But I decided to go with something called a Bedarian knife. This really stems from the Bedarian culture. They are a culture that existed around 4400 to 4000 BC. So in the timeline of the world, it's relatively recent. The unique thing about the Bedarian culture is that they were in Egypt and they were a pre-dynastic culture. It was really based on agriculture, fishing, and animal husbandry, meaning they kept livestock. This is all pre-dynastic. This is pre-pharaohs and pre the pyramids and all that sort of stuff that we kind of associate with Egypt. They kept cattle, sheep, and goats. That was their livestock. Um, they also kept dogs. Dogs were very sacred to them as they find dog remains in very many ceremonial burial sites. They used uh, a style of primitive throw stick or rabbit stick to hunt gazelle and take game and probably all sorts of waterfowl. More importantly, they still use flint and shirt tools. Um, they still had a variety of arrow points and arrowheads, you know, for hunting with a bow or defense. And they still used flint knives. The knife they carried was pretty simple in form. It wasn't extravagant, it wasn't anything crazy, but I do believe it was probably a very common knife that was carried amongst many of the people while they were out, you know, fishing or hunting or tending to their livestock. Kind of reminds me of a simple pocket knife, maybe like an old school buck knife that your grandfather gave to you, or just a knife that could be easily worn on the hip, but it seems more of like that EDC, that everyday carry knife, for the Bedarian culture. Very easy to make knife, and I have no doubt it got the job done. So let's make the Bedarian shouldered knife. So Chirts and Flints were the obvious stone that they were using. Probably very easy to collect. They probably had their quarry sites. There was probably a routine collection because they were using them for a lot of tools. Now when we look at a Bedarian knife, you could see just a small little chunk is taken out to give it that single shoulder. Now. I do believe that this knife wasn't actually hafted. The reason why is that if we put ourselves on a farm or we put ourselves on a fishing boat, we're always fishing, we're always hunting, we're always doing something. Anytime we make a stone blade and we take one stone blade and we haft it into an antler or a piece of wood and we glue it up with pine pitch, something to that extent, that is ultimately a point of failure. Now for a culture to exist that was so into raising livestock and agriculture and fishing and hunting, they would probably want to try to reduce that point of failure as much as possible. You'd hate to be out grazing your livestock somewhere and your knife fails on you. So based on my research, it was a relatively smaller blade. Was it hafted? It's hard to tell. Because that shoulder exists, it makes me believe that something was wrapped around that base leading up to the shoulder, giving it just a little bit more of a comfort in the hand when cutting nets, cutting game, cutting anything really as that kind of EDC knife. A little bigger. I like it. That's a good flake. Even when you look at this, for anyone that's starting that napping, you can kind of see on this piece of stone right here. I pop that flake. Because this stone has just a little bit of a dip right here, this flake was not going to travel up, then down, and then back up again. It's very hard for stone to do that. So when I pop the flake, it terminated almost in a little, well, yeah, it terminated in a little bit of a hinge right here. It's not an issue, because as I got all this working side here, I'll just meet all of those flakes. But you always have to think, if you think of a saddle, it looks like this. You got a mound, a saddle, and a mound. If you try to drive a flake from one saddle to the other, it's going to stop. Right when one saddle really starts to dip down, you won't get the good flakes that you want. One, two, three. Good.
Give it a pop, clears it out. I have a little swirl here in the stone, but she'll nap out. One. I don't know where that flake went, but it was sitting here. Popped it, raised my edge up, so now I can come this way. A little abrasion. Slowly get rid of the cortex. Now a couple of the knives that have been recovered in archaeological sites were a little small, between like three and a half to like five inches. In my mind, that just tells me that they were used, reworked, reshapened, were kind of that utility tool. Little hole right there. I'm gonna try and hit right over to this side. Sometimes holes and crystals and things to that extent can definitely be an issue. This presents kind of a struggle for some folks when you have straight, almost like box. When I have a nice flat surface like this, it's flat here, it's flat here, it's flat here, so almost two 90 degree angles. I need to try to take this stone and give it more of a wavy edge like this. Now how I do this is I'm gonna be alternating the stone back and forth. I'm gonna lose some of my mass on this side, but as I'm creating my wave on this side, it's gonna give me an opportunity to throw thinning flakes. How I do it is, I attack this down the lateral edges. So I try and throw long flakes from this platform here, from there, from there, and then from there. We'll take my stone wall as you see it and shrink it down to about right there, and then I can just pop it off. All right, first hit, it's prepared. There we go. So when I came in at that angle, I struck here with my direction of travel coming this way. And I was trying to just reduce as much of this wall down while still drawing a flake. And that's the result. Instead of hitting the stone straight up and down, I came in at an angle to create that bulb of percussion right here. This one little shard popped out. Everything is put back in place. You can see a line right here. That's really creating that bulb, and it's blowing out this bottom flake, and it's giving me now an opportunity to come back and do the exact same thing this way. So give it a grind. That right there is my platform. So this one I'm gonna kinda slap it a little bit, but I'm gonna come down with it. Took off that flake right there. And I'm starting to create my little wave pattern. This will be my next spot. Good. Flake kind of broke up. You can see my flake scar traveled into the stone and then reduce my edge. Let's do another one on the billet. Let's get the side of it with the billet. Good. All right, and just looking at it now, you can see creating that wave behind it. And this is my wall. My wall used to extend out to about right here, and I've reduced it in size immensely without creating a lot of problems. So it's about striking towards you, striking away from you, trying to use this flat edge and the little platforms you create as your, your direction of travel, your, the, the direction you want to hit that stone and remove. Going this way, tilt up. Took the 
whole chunk right off. Perfect. You gotta understand, if you're coming to these flat faces, if you're hitting the stone down, you're just gonna be taking off a little chip side to side. But when you come at an angle, it puts the mass of your stone in this place instead of underneath. Because remember, when you strike, you're trying to remove flakes from this bifacial form. When I tilt my stone and I come at this angle, I'm kind of now saying, I'm no longer gonna be hitting this stone, I'm going for this stone. So a little bit of an angle, different direction of strike, and you can pop off the piece. I've got a nice wavy edge full of platforms, and I am good to go. One, two, a little thin. Good. We're over. Good. Got to hit it with some some pumps. There we go. So as I went down, my edge was sitting over here. I removed one, two, three, four flakes. It raises my edge, allows me now to address this top side. Do it again. One, two. All right, so we are bifacial. We've gotten to that point. I've already switched down to a little bit softer billet and this is where I'm gonna kind of start defining the shape, which is gonna have a little bit more of a laurel leaf look. Once I have that shape, is when I'll take out that shoulder, kind of turn it into that Baldari knife. using these flat stones get some of those nice little thin flakes nice and flat you can just pop them off like a little soft percussive good abrasion though good abrasion another good one So there's two ways to bring these sides in. You can start, uh, you know, chipping away, just kind of chewing up the sides, raising your edges, or you can do it through flaking. If I focus all my flaking on my lateral sides, I will naturally take this edge in, take this edge in, and then also thin it out. Pop some flakes. One. Even though it broke, not the end of the world. So that flake was sitting on there. If I would have chewed this up, this flake would have kind of come out different. I would could have taken out more of my edge. But as I'm looking to thin this guy, you can see just where that flake scar and where that flake is. That's a nice flake coming across. Just past the middle, when I come to the other side, I'll be able to meet it. More importantly, I'm starting to reduce and bring this edge in so I can have a little bit longer blade and it's not as wide. This is where, you know, pressure flaking can start coming in. And the pressure flaking is, it's not a final flaking. You're not really giving it form, but you're, you're kind of just looking at it and saying, I've got one little mass I'm gonna try and get it off with 
pressure flaking instead of running it with some impact through percussion. That's where I want to be as far as the thickness. Got one little hinge that's aggravating me. I might be able to pressure flake that out, but if not, I'll just turn that to where the shoulder is. So majority of the blade will be up in here, two cutting sides, and that shoulder right in here. And the shoulder's kind of a gentle swoop in. This is five and a half from tip to end. Uh, actually five and three quarter, maybe a little, little off the end, but I'll get that when I'm pressure flaking. But uh, we're almost there. Might do a couple more little <clears throat> removals with my soft billet or my flat stone, but those will come as necessary. gonna work keep this straightness and just shape it we are good to go so I'm starting to take my shoulder and you can see this was the original length that was the tail end and I'm taking a little bit of the stone and I'm gonna move my shoulder up to about right here that's where I want to kind of maybe a little bit higher right there but I just don't chip, 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 chip down the whole side. I chip a little bit, and then I flake, and then I chip a little bit more, and then I flake. It's just a good little habit of, if you have to take stone from some sort of bifacial form for whatever you're creating, to take a little bit, flake, take a little bit, then flake. If you take too much, you could create some high spots, you run into problems. Not that the world's over, but you know, if you can avoid the issues, it makes life a little bit easier. Let's go schmear. Right here. Here. Do that one right there. Gotcha. We're still friends. Good. That is looking 
right to me. Be a good little farm, agriculture, fishing, hunting little blade. Yeah, let's do a wrap. What we got? What we got? Some sort of wrap at the handle. It just makes sense, even though I've ground it down and it's totally smooth. I'm gonna wrap the handle. It feels, it feels right. It just feels right. Nice and tight. I'm getting ready to tie it off, finger underneath. So essentially I'm wrapping, wrap my finger, create a little pocket right there. Slide that through, pull it. Stays nice and neat. Good. Little animal fat on the handle. That's always, always got to put a little treatment on the handle. And then when everything is said and done, you have one Darien knife. This is Cool little blade. I think a sheath would be necessary. I mean, for a pre-dynastic flint chert, you know, blade used by the Bedarian culture, you know, in the pursuits of hunting and fishing and agriculture and tending to their livestock, this seems like it would be a very easy kind of like everyday care. I mean, just as I'm putting it in my hands, I've got the ability to really just kind of hold on to it with a couple of those fingers and then use the blade if I was cutting nets or cutting a, uh, an animal open or, I don't know. It's kind of a little utility knife. I can imagine the blade dropping a little bit in its overall width and thickness. Same thing with the handle. And eventually it's probably discarded or turned into something else. That right there is one Bedaria knife, pre-dynastic knife from Egypt. Pretty awesome. Thanks for watching.